All right. Hey, I think we should probably kick this thing off, right? Uh, I'm so excited to bring our friends from the Innovation Toolkit team from MITRE in here. Um, ever since I've been kind of online in the defense innovation space, I've kind of found my way to their content over and over. They're pushing just incredible stuff. So be sure to be following them on LinkedIn uh, primarily, I think, is where you're pushing most of your content. Uh, Dan Ward and uh, Jen Choi and uh, Rachel Gregorio are just doing incredible work. And I think it's kind of a side hustle for them. Uh, so it's impressive what they're doing. But I'm going to just kick it over to you, uh, Jen and Rachel, to, to start things off. Yeah, absolutely. Daniel and everyone here, thanks for inviting us. Um, Rachel and I, on behalf of Team Toolkit, are thrilled to be here. Um, when we first found out about this project starting, we were like, yeah, go, go. So we've always been cheering you on and I'm really happy to help in any way. Really excited for the tools we're going to present today. And, you know, today, tomorrow, next year, five years, please reach out to us. Um, we do have a public facing site and an email and as Daniel mentioned, uh, we are on LinkedIn, so you can definitely find us. Um, before we get started, I'd kind of love to just kind of get a sampling of who is out there. So if each of you could go to the chat and let's just start with um, some demographics of like, where are you? Um, are you in the DC area? We know we got people in the islands. Um, we might have some people on the West Coast. Just curious to see how many different time zones are we representing here? All right, Baltimore. Woohoo! Uh, for reference, I'm here in the DC area. I'm in Arlington, and Rachel is up in Boston. I'm in the other Arlington. I'm in Arlington, Mass. <laughs> yeah. Excellent. Awesome. Ooh, Texas. Okay, cool. Tampa. Nice. Oh, Boston. Christina. I think you're the other Jen Choi. You have to change your name. <laughs> Cool. Okay, so we've got someone else from Boston. Excellent. Uh, we know this is the Defense Entrepreneurs Forum. Uh, we, I know we've got some Air Force people. Um, if you're comfortable with it and willing to share, you know, what organization do you support? That way Rachel and I can kind of customize some of the examples we might have. So if you're willing to share that, go ahead, throw that in the chat too. Okay, maybe everybody is Air Force. Ooh, EOD, cool. Nice. Okay, excellent, excellent. Non-DOD, okay, excellent, love that. Great diversity. <laughs> Daylighting, okay. <laughs> I love this. Okay, excellent. And last request I've got so I have you guys on gallery view so I can see your responses. Um, if you go to reactions, go ahead and give me a thumbs up if you have already facilitated an innovation workshop or done some design thinking oriented effort with your teams. So thumbs up if you've done a workshop and you've done design thinking. Okay, cool. Excellent. Um, so give me some clapping hands if you haven't done this yet, but you really want to bring it into your organization. So you might be a first time facilitator. Um, you're kind of looking for tips on, hey, how do I even do this? How do I get started? I want to do it solo. Okay, excellent. Okay, cool. All right, so I've got a good spread of people. Um, it's fantastic to hear. Thanks for giving those inputs. Um, and you know, if you have questions, definitely feel free to go off of mute and just ask us or throw something in the chat. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, so Rachel, can we go to the next slide? Okay, excellent. So Daniel gave us a wonderful introduction. Rachel and I are here, and we thought it would also help to give some testimonials from other folks um, that Innovation Toolkit has worked with in the past year. Um, we stood this up a few years ago, but we were definitely accelerating our, in our progress, as Daniel mentioned. This was indeed our side hustle. Uh, we typically work other projects and this was actually started as an entrepreneurial effort. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that later. So we've worked with all sorts of levels within defense, um, enlisted officers, FOGO, um, SESs, people without a rank, civilians, and we really embrace the diversity and the different groups of people. 
we have not always necessarily had the most welcoming audience. So we've had to go into workshops with non-believers or people who were like, oh, I'm not into this. So we're here to tell you it can be done and we're gonna give you some tactics on how you can do that. Okay, next. All right, so who is Innovation Toolkit? What is MITRE? Why are we here? So MITRE is a not-for-profit. Our headquarters are in McLean, Virginia, and we also have a very large presence in the Boston area. We have many locations, both nationwide and worldwide, and we operate seven federally funded research and development centers. So basically, we do R&D for the government. Um, our our origin, original FFRDC was in the Defense Department, uh, but we've then expanded into other areas like healthcare, the Census Bureau, um, DOJ, FFA, FAA, excuse me. So we do kind of a wide diversity of work. And our core strength is systems engineering. So looking at complex systems, excuse me, and seeing how they can work together and be interoperable on um, seeing how everything can fit. You know, our Pat line, McClintock. Join the meeting. Oh, excellent. Okay. Um, so Innovation Toolkit, uh, we're a team within MITRE. Uh, we consider ourselves innovation catalysts, and what we do is we teach people, hey, what is innovation and how do we do it? I'm so glad to be talking with this group because I think we already have many innovation enthusiasts, and here we're really going to focus on, okay, but how do we bring this to people? How do we start informing how people may look at things differently? So next. Um, I mentioned earlier we are an entrepreneurial team. Uh, originally this started as a side hustle in Boston and now we're in Utah and McLean. Uh, we have uh, our teammates represented here and Rachel and I are here. Join the meeting. Okay and all of us um, <clears throat> are engineers and we do different types of project work. So I'm Jen. Um, I'm a systems engineer. I started in chemistry, did a career switch into systems engineering, um, and then did a major career switch later and was an entrepreneur and I worked at as, as an executive coach helping teams work on their strategy. Um, since I come back to MITRE, I thought I'd be just doing straight engineering and then I found this awesome team and was like, yes. So this is really my favorite thing to do at MITRE. And Rachel, how about you introduce yourself too? Yeah, hi everyone. I'm Rachel Gregorio. I've been a MITRE for a few years now, similar to Jen, did a career switch. Not from chemistry, uh, but from art and marketing, communications, and uh, found user experience design and human factors engineering and just saw it as such a great um, combination of all the things that I really liked and then added the layer of you know, helping people and helping um, our nation solve tough problems at MITRE and um, have loved it ever since. So that's, that's me and we have, a, as you can see from the slide, have a really multidisciplinary team all about diversity, bringing diverse perspectives together. I think that's part of the secret sauce that makes this work. So what is ITK? We've been talking about it for a bit now. Uh, it is a collection of around two dozen methods that are based in human-centered engineering practices that are domain agnostic, low cost, high impact methods that can get your teams um, innovating. To, keep it short and sweet. Um, we do have a definition for innovation since it is kind of a hot buzzword. Uh, we like to say that it's novelty with impact. So one without the other is not enough. And that's how we go about um, starting all of our sessions is just getting everyone on the same page and thinking about what are you trying to do that is new and has an impact. We get teams asking the right questions and building consensus around those questions. One of our favorites is what problem are we trying to solve? And you'd think that would be a really easy question to answer, but oftentimes it's not. I see some head nods in the, in the audience. So that's great to hear you relate to that, um, that challenge. Oftentimes we get into the room and everyone says, oh yeah, of course, we, we all are on the same page. And then you go around and everyone has a different definition of the problem. So uh, getting everyone on the same page, you'll see a lot of our tools come with templates and worksheets, which we'll show some examples of as we go through this um, introduction. But we like to say that those constraints, those questions, those templates can really breed creativity. So knowing that you need to fill out every box on a sheet or answer every question 
will actually push you past those limits of creativity rather than looking at a blank white piece of paper. Uh, the tools are a mixture of convergent and divergent thought. The double diamond on that bottom left post-it is a pretty commonly used term. We'll talk about that a little bit more. And we like to have all of our tools identify some sort of actionable insight or value so that you don't leave the session saying, okay, what now? We all have kind of our next steps, our marching orders, if you will. What are we gonna go do to make an impact and make a difference? All right. Uh, so here is an overview of all the tools in our toolkit to date, 25 tools. And we've buck bucketed them into these six categories based on the use case or what your team is trying to accomplish. So you'll see we do have a category for generate ideas. And oftentimes, I think innovation can be defined as just like, okay, let's get in a room and brainstorm. And we definitely do have tools to help your team do that, but we have more than that. So helping your team to go beyond brainstorming, starting with things like frame the problem, um, a few tools in that section. And then once you have come up with ideas, you need to oftentimes evaluate those options and select the most feasible, practical, impactful options that you would like to move forward with. And then as you start developing your product, you really need to understand who are you developing this for? Who's your user? What are their pains? What are the gains that we're trying to uh, help alleviate? Um, and then developing a plan for how to roll it out and reducing that complexity as you go. So that's kind of a very high level overview of what the tools and the kit can help you do. I think oftentimes it can be a bit overwhelming to know where to start. So we're going to highlight a couple of the tools today with you and of course open up for questions at the end once we once we go through. We do have uh, a website itk.mitre.org where you can find all of the tools and each tool you'll see like on the left comes with a little description of what it is, some recipe information of what your session might look like, how long, how many people, when we recommend using the tool, why you might use it, and then a step-by-step process of how, and you can download um, a template on the right-hand side to get the PDF on your end. And don't forget to subscribe to our blog. Um, like Daniel said, we're posting content every week out there. We're resharing it on LinkedIn, but you can get it right to your inbox on a monthly basis. We won't spam you too much, we promise. <laughs> if you sign up, you'll get a little digest every month. Okay. So one of the uh, unique things about our toolkit is the idea of tool chains. So whenever we're planning a workshop, we oftentimes uh, will string multiple tools together. And that workshop could be in one session or it could be over the course of weeks, um, especially in the virtual environment that we're in. We haven't subjected anyone to a full day virtual session where we go through a bunch of tools. So maybe we would do one tool one day, one tool the next day, that sort of thing. Um, but these are some suggestions to get you started. And the idea behind the tool chains is that the input of one tool, the output of one tool is the input for the next tool. So you, in that first example of I need an idea, the system map goes through all of the players, all of the who, the pains, what's going on, and then there's disruptors at the bottom. And so typically what we recommend doing is picking one of those disruptors that's making the most impact and then using the Lotus Blossom, which is an ideation tool to come up with a bunch of ideas around that disruptor and then storm drain to um, get rid of tools, um, get rid of ideas that are not feasible or you don't like. So storm draining is like the opposite of brainstorming. It trims down um, the number. So you don't leave with just a big page of ideas. You leave with one and steps to move forward. So that's just an example of how you might use one of these tool chains. Jen, anything to add uh, at this point? I feel like I've been talking for a while. <laughs> No, and one thing I would just emphasize as a tip for folks who are new to workshops, um, sometimes people who tend to be more technical or more analytical, just giving them this overview of like, hey, we're going to lead you through what feels like an ambiguous process, and we're going to start with one tool, 
and the output of that is going to be the input to this. You start getting that buy-in of like, oh, okay, this is building to somewhere. This is leading us somewhere. Okay, got it. And then that allows them to kind of relax a little <clears throat> and not immediately jump on the first tool because, you know, that just may be your warm-up tool. So, And it helps um, when you have a full day workshop planned, right? You're mm -hmm. saying, okay, we're going to spend the whole day and we're going to figure this out. Okay, what are you going to do um, to get there? Mm -hmm. yep. uh, we got some fans of the system map in the chat. Awesome. Glad Yay. to hear it. Love those disruptions. <laughs> Great. So circling back to the double diamond once more to just talk about uh, the importance of defining the problem that you're trying to solve before jumping into the solution. So I got some head nods when we talked about how oftentimes it's difficult to get to consensus and agreement around the problem we're solving. Um, but we do emphasize spending time thinking about that and really exploring the problem space so that you're designing the right thing before you design the thing right. So those are the two diamonds. And uh, each diamond is a combination of divergent thinking, coming up with a lot of ideas, wild and crazy, the more the merrier, and then coupled with convergent thinking so you don't leave overwhelmed and you really narrow it down to what do we plan on doing. So we'll often use this along with the tool chains. Sometimes you'll see us workshop planning and we'll be jotting on each of these diamonds. Okay, well, what's the divergent tool to help define the problem space? And what's the convergent tool? Once we come up with all the ideas for the solution, what are we going to do to get down to you know, the delivery of the concept? So it's a good framework just to... Um, it doesn't have to be exact, right? This is not an exact science, but um, it does help oftentimes, especially when we're showing engineers who love the science and love the back-to-back <laughs> um, -back of the tools, they'll, they'll really um, kind of understand, okay, I see the flow of what we're doing here. Okay, so we're gonna move on to a tool spotlight. And um, one of our favorite tools that we use a lot is called the pre-mortem. So post-mortem you've likely heard of is done after someone has passed away to figure out what, what was the cause of death, right? So pre-mortem is what you do before there is a, a death or we like to say before a failure and you envision that failure and understand what caused that failure to happen. So this is our um, pre-mortem canvas. And I know there's a lot of questions on here. You can um, jump to the website if you want to zoom in and take a closer look at these questions as well. Um, but what you'll see is a lot of questions about this future failure. So this is kind of a sci-fi-ish tool. You're getting your uh, participants outside their comfort zone right away to think about this project failing. And without a doubt, every time we start this tool, everyone says, well, what's the failure? And we say, what is the failure? <laughs> that is the question that we're trying to answer. Um, so scoping is an important part of this. Uh, failure can look like a lot of different things to a lot of different people. And that's the discussion that we want to have, right? Failure to me might look completely different from failure to Jen, may look completely different from failure to Daniel. So getting all those ideas out on the table, we do like to start with some time for people to jot down ideas for about five to 10 minutes before we start sharing, just because if you, if I share what I think failure is, then everyone's likely going to go down that pathway versus having that diversity of ideas, that diversity of thought that we really want everyone to bring to the table and um, get those different perspectives out there. So you'll see on the canvas, the left-hand side describes the failure. What did we do to cause this project to fail? What did we not do? Uh, what is What are still the problems? What are their new problems? So you'll hear people say things like, we didn't talk to each other. We didn't share, um, you know, lessons learned with each other. Some, those are just some things that are kind of across the board, some failure causes that we hear often. Um, what did we do that caused it to fail? What did we not do? So lots of very probing kind of intense questions that when you're in that mindset, it can get a little bit uh, sad. <laughs> I think the questions who knew we'd fail really is a vulnerab vulnerability type of a question, right? Uh, we were doing this with a team once and they said, everyone, everyone knew we'd fail. Whoa, <laughs> that, 
that is kind of crazy to get out there in the open, but it's important, right? When you're starting a project and you know that failure is on the table, that's really going to change the way that you think about planning for the project and communicate the project. Um, it's a really different perspective. And then those two fill in the blank questions in the center box, if the only thing we do is blank, it's a win. And if we don't do blank, it's a fail are probably the key questions on the canvas to get to. If people don't fill out the entire thing, we always drive home, let's fill that in. And that kind of serves as your North Star at the, um, at the end of the session where you say, okay, let's write that on the board. If we only do blank, it's a win, let's drive towards that. Um, and then I always really encourage people to spend some time to get positive at the end of a pre-mortem session. It's very easy to get down in the dumps. We're going to fail. We're doomed. <laughs> this is never going to work out. And that's not the point of this. We really want to say, okay, now that we know what could cause us to fail, we haven't, we haven't failed yet. Let's update our goals. Let's mitigate those risks. So if it is, hey, we aren't talking to each other enough, what are we going to do to mitigate that if we think that will cause failure? If um, there's a key stakeholder that knew we would fail, what's our, what's our game plan with that stakeholder? Do we want to convince him or her why we won't fail? Do we want to, um, you probably want to have some sort of strategy there. So that's the uh, actionable insights part of this tool that we really encourage everyone to get to. John, anything to add on the canvas while we're looking at it? Yeah, um, so I've got two tips. Um, one, as facilitators, you know, there's an art and science behind this. So the art in the pre-mortem is like, how far ahead do you tell people to look into the future? Um, depending on the project, if you tell them two to three years, that may be too close. So people get a little too anxious about this. So you may want to recommend five to seven. Or you may be trying to really encourage disruption. So you may say, 20 years from now, 30 years from now, and just giving that intro prompt of like, imagine a dystopian future, right? Allow people to get really wild with their ideas. And sometimes even just as you're facilitating, going through and acknowledging the different failures people said, like Rachel said, people have different perceptions. Um, to give a flavor, one session that we did, people mentioned things like such as the customer is unhappy, all the way to like our team ends up fighting, all the way to like defense as a whole gets like disrupted and no longer- We're all fired from our jobs. Yeah, like <laughs> it, it's okay to allow that. And maybe you actually do it twice. Once to just say, what is the failure? And then all agree on one failure scenario and then do it again. Um, the second tip that I have is, again, this is another way to arm yourself against disbelievers. Um, there's scientific evidence that shows when you do a pre-mortem, when you look at a failure before it happens, it actually unlocks the part of your brain where you are much better at predicting risk. I think it's like 10 to 15%. I have an HBR article, so if any of you guys want it, um, feel free to email itk at mitre.org or email us. Happy to send that out. But I always is preface this type of strategically our brains are smarter now than after we fail and we're looking in hindsight great great tips Jen thank you a couple more points on when and why you might want to use pre-mortem we typically like to say at the beginning of an activity but honestly I have um, used this with a team that was like two years into a project and they weren't making progress and they needed a reevaluation, and that was uh, a perfect time for them to, hey, let's get it all on the same page and refocus on what our goals really need to be. Uh, by defining that failure, like we said, it inversely provides clarity around what success does look like, gets that vulnerable truth out on the table, and identifies the potential causes for failure. Um, just an example of our fellow ITK team member, Dan Ward, running a pre-mortem session with NASA. Um, pretty interesting findings as he was running this session, as you can see, lots of ex um, people in the room getting these feelings out on the table. And rather than um, things like, oh, we didn't you know, get to the moon again, or we didn't accomplish X mission, their idea of the only thing we do is blankets a win was 
um, was learning and collaborating and continuing those research partnerships. So the end result might surprise you and that's what we're hoping for. One more quick note on failure is uh, part of our team culture that we, we haven't done in a while since we haven't been in person, but we do like to celebrate failure with failure cakes. Uh, so encouraging that fast failure and um, putting a positive spin on trying and things not succeeding, um, all part of innovation and just making people feel that it's okay to try and it not work out and we'll get them next time. <laughs> so uh, that's just something that you can use with your teams if you um, are in a, in a situation where you're maybe submitting an idea for a conference or something like that. Um, would recommend kind of a fun, fun pick me up. <laughs> um, all right. Any questions on premortem before we move on to our next tool? Yeah, Jen. Hey, Rachel, we got a good one uh, from Michael. He asked, how long do you work through the premortem canvas with the team? How long does it typically take to work through? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I typically like to give at least an hour for the premortem um, and maybe 90 minutes just to make sure that you leave that time for the um, the positive spin at the end. Um, it can be, you can be crunched for time, especially because there are so many questions. If people, if you're with a group that really wants to fill in everything, then um, you'll probably need to allow for that time or inversely um, just be really strict with the time and make sure, hey, we have 15 minutes left, let's update our goals and let's come up with some risk mitigation strategies because uh, you don't want people leaving that room just imagining failure, period. <laughs> Perfect, thank you. Thanks for the question. Any others? Okay, cool. Uh, we can move on to our next tool spotlight, Jen will take us through the culture change canvas. Sure. Okay. So um, before I jump into culture change, one of the things I wanted to say is um, Rachel had mentioned this in the beginning of how our toolkit uses a lot of human centered design and design thinking. So our toolkit has a lot of things you'll find in other toolkits like IDEO or Acrobat, like what's a persona? Um, <clears throat> like you know, what is my value proposition? We have those things. And the reason why we chose to feature the pre-mortem and the culture change is these are two unique ones to the MITRE toolkit. And we also thought particularly with this community that is starting new efforts and trying to disrupt and do things differently that these are some tools that would be awesome to have in your back pocket. Um, but certainly later when we have open questions, like please feel free to ask us about the other tools or design thinking methods, like happy to riff on that. Okay, so let's talk culture. Um, I would love to hear from you guys again. Uh, uh, what is culture in your words? And if you've got nothing, you can say, I've got nothing. <laughs> I think you cut out there slightly, Jen, for a second, but you asked, what is culture in your own words? Mm -hmm. That's So correct. just drop that in the chat. Okay, unwritten ways we do what we do, the way we think, feel, and act as a team, awesome. An agreed upon collection of social norms. Excellent, excellent. Love this. It's not the behaviors, it's the stuff underneath and driving behaviors, unique aspects to individuals and teams. Excellent, cool. Okay, um, I love all of these. I think they're spot on. Uh, definitely culture similar to innovation is this like Thing that we all know it what it is but when we try to get really precise our language sometimes fails us so for purposes of the culture change canvas tool um, here on team toolkit we define culture as shared beliefs and behaviors so it's 
what are the things that we do when nobody is looking? Um, another way I like hearing this described is by Seth Godin. He says, um, people like us do stuff like that, right? So how we identify who belongs in our culture and what are the types of things that we do. So there's different types of culture. There's organizational culture. There's also subcultures. There's project cultures. There's meeting cultures. Um, here on this call, I think we have some flavor of startup culture. You know, Project Agitare is just since March um, in its beginnings and really taking off. Uh, on the opposite side of that, we would have these like massive mega corporations, things that have been around for hundreds of years. They will definitely have a culture. Um, other things, uh, minor, we're a not-for-profit. That's going to be different than an industry profit-oriented culture or someone who is a government culture. Um, I asked in the beginning our locations because we've got East Coast culture, we've got West Coast culture, we've got Boston culture, DC, we've got Tampa, we've got Hawaii. So just kind of understanding, you know, where is everyone coming from when we come together um, in this call? Those are really important things to be aware of that are often unspoken and pretty subtle. You know, no one's just gonna come into a call and be like, yo, I've got DC culture, I'm nonprofit, and oh, by the way, I'm really into sports. Not really how we introduce ourselves, but we kind of say it through our languages and what we say and what we do. Um, okay, next let's move on. One other thing about culture that is so wonderful and also so frustrating is that it takes time. One of the things we say is culture is like patina, not paint. Paint, you can just put it on in an hour on a wall and boom, you've totally hidden whatever black mark you're trying to uh, remove. With patina, you actually need time for this to emerge. So patina is kind of like, you can kind of see it here on that brick wall. Um, if you've ever gone to like an outdoor park and seen a statue that's all like crusty in that green color that has been oxidized, like that's patina. And what's interesting is that in the art world, like this is like, people go crazy for it. They're like, oh my God, look at like the richness of it. I don't know. Um, they describe it in very like artistic ways. And the point here is, Culture is something that takes time. We have to be patient with it. It doesn't change overnight. Of course, there are some exceptions when something drastic happens that dynamically disrupts us. 9-11, COVID, things that in an instant change how we think and how we believe that happens. But by and large, culture generally tends to be something slower. So for those of you who are embarking on culture change, like have faith, right? Like go and get that brick and <laughs> just remember like this brick is not for hitting your head against. This is to inspire you that patina will happen. It just takes time. Okay, next. Um, very similarly, you know, culture is not monolithic. Um, I like seeing Michael's comment about culture is something that can divide us, but something that can make us one. So certainly in an organization, you can have a very clear vision or an inspiring mission where everyone's like, yeah, we're going to that. NASA is a great example. Everyone is working to the moon. And at the same time, you can have subcultures. You know, your engineering team may have had a culture that's quite different from your business team or your marketing team. So understanding that not like culture, it doesn't have to be just the one thing. You know, it is okay to have these subcultures and to diversify. Daniel, yes, I really like that comment. <laughs> Making sure you manage your energy and not burning out when culture takes time. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, thanks, Rachel. Okay, so with culture change, one of our main ethos here is we want to do this with people and not to people. You know, one of our main values on Team Toolkit is we like to include others from the very beginning. Not only does this get us buy-in, we get diversity of thought, and actually, you know, we also build more team camaraderie. We kind of create a culture. So as facilitators, this is something that's very important, regardless of you're doing culture change or a persona session or a brainstorming you know, inviting everyone in, saying it's okay to have different thoughts and doing it with people. Um, I hope people can't relate, but if you can, 
sometimes you may be in a position when somebody new comes in, like a leader or an authority, and they say, okay, no more of this. We're doing everything like this from now on. And your whole team's like, but what we were doing was working. <laughs> You know, like, and kind of feeling that like abruptness of like, oh, wow, this change was just dictated upon us and we had no say. Great. You it kind of naturally become resistant. So especially with something like culture, the more you can invite people in, honestly, the earlier, the better, truly. Every two years in the military. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Next. Um, okay, and of course, you know, with culture, we have to acknowledge, you know, some are healthier and more productive than others, and this can fluctuate within an organization. You know, I always look at, hey, who are the top 100 companies to look for? Because that tells me, hey, here's a culture of workers who are inspired and who like to work um, and pretty productive. Usually they are doing pretty well. You know, it is tough sometimes when organizations go through tough times. I'm thinking of actually Southwest, um, not in the current times, but in our last depression, when their CEO actually said, okay, he was really vulnerable and said, I don't wanna have to make cuts. Are people willing to voluntarily do reduce pay so that we don't have to fire people? And everyone did. So that kind of says something about that culture. You know, and another thing too is that cultures are unique. What works in one culture may not work in another. Uh, here in defense, I think a lot of our elite teams, right? Like our special forces or things like um, where you have to have really elite skills, special ops. And although like elite and elitism may have a negative culture, Oftentimes with these groups, the feedback I hear is they're sometimes the most humble and kind, right? They're most team oriented. So although that culture may not necessarily be inclusive because you do have to meet certain requirements to be in it, you can't just invite everyone. In that case, it's not necessarily a bad thing, right? Because they have such a targeted mission, but they are very like humble and team oriented. In another culture, you could have a group that's very exclusive but also very not team oriented. So, you know, be careful on how you describe culture and don't just automatically write off certain adjectives. What works in one may not work in another. And you really just kind of want to look at, hey, what's healthy for us? What is going to inspire us to be more productive? Okay. Ooh, I love your suggestion, Daniel, about uh, the playbook. Okay, so this is the Culture Change Canvas. Um, there's many components, so we're going to break it down a little bit. Um, what I usually recommend as facilitators is work your way left to right. So first, we're going to go into the left-hand side. Oh, first I should tell you when to use it. Okay, <laughs> we can go back to that. Um, so you can use this anytime, you know, you're noticing like, hey, this may not be a process problem or problem solving problem like this may be regarding our beliefs and behaviors. So you can use it when you're trying to establish a new culture. You can use it as a conversation starter when you notice, oh, this culture isn't great. Maybe we want to do something to change it. And what I really love about this tool is that inherently by doing it, you're starting to create a plan and roadmap for how you can change your culture. It's really powerful tool to use periodically. So whenever you want to have a culture change conversation, start with the tool, do a workshop with your team. And then at that meeting, commit and say, okay, let's revisit this in six months. And at that point, you can look at it again and say, okay, how much action did we take? What new actions do we need to do? And keep revisiting it, right? Like that patina thought of like, you can't just do it once, come back to it. Another thing too, I think especially with this group, it's a very powerful tool to bring to leadership. Um, this may be sometimes difficult to do. However, having a structured format and knowing that you've identified different aspects of culture and you're not just going to quote unquote complain to your boss, um, I think it creates a lot more empowerment as well as easy ways for your leaders to say yes. Okay. Now let's step into it. We do have one question, Jen, before we go oh, on yeah. from Steven. Do you think this would be beneficial when coming into the lead position of a new team just to establish consensus and clarity? Yes. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I love this question. Oh my gosh. If you are a new leader and you have the opportunity to start 
intentionally creating a culture with your team, oh my gosh, yes, please, please, please do it. Um, use this tool as a starter and you, uh, there's many other things uh, we can talk a little bit more about and ask me if you can come off of mute at that time and we can kind of riff on like, what kind of exercises did you do to build team bonding? I highly, highly recommend the book, The Culture Code. It's really great and actually um, steps through some exercises of how you can really create a high performing team. Excellent. Yes, Dan Coyle. Nice. Yes. Okay. okay. All right. So the left hand side, um, this is when we are kind of just doing a mini evaluation. So on the first part, you're describing the current culture. We have a spectrum of adjectives. Again, no right, no wrong. It's just to examine at this point in time, what are we valuing? So for example, you might have some organizations that are like, I don't care about money, just go fast, get me something. Or you might have an organization that's like, we have no money, literally, uh, don't spend money. So it's just to kind of get the conversation going of where are we, what are some of these beliefs and values that we have? Um, we have a notional list here to help get you started. Um, really, I, one of the ones that I find a lot, especially in defense, is the conversations around risk, either avoiding risk or tolerating risk, um, so, you know, kind of use your facilitator's sixth sense to guide people in this conversation and feel free to throw in some traits of your own that are uh, unique to the language or your organization. Um, the next part of it, then you start looking at the future. You know, what does our desired culture look like? Oftentimes we people just saying, people say the opposite of what we have. And it's like, okay, can we get a little more tactical? Can we start <laughs> using adjectives or things like that? And I think that one of the most important questions is the last one. Where does the desired culture already exist? This is the key question. Um, oftentimes in organizations, it may exist in one person. It may exist in two people or a project, or you may have an element of something. Again, as facilitators, this is how you empower your participants by saying, it's not bleak, we already have something started, um, we can get going. Alternatively, or in tandem, you can also use this as an inspiration corner. You can say, oh, well, what are the organizations that we're trying to aspire to be like? What are the cultures that we want to be like? And you can put some concrete examples there um, to, so everyone has a similar lingo to talk to. Okay, now let's get into the canvas. So the whole right hand side is um, four different quadrants and you can really tackle this at any, you know, there is really no order. They're all equivalent. For purposes of this, we're just gonna go left to right. So the first one is about your organizational leaders. You know, the messages from the top. What are they saying? What should they, what should they be saying? You know, how can we measure that? What kind of incentives are they giving? Who are they actually rewarding? A lot of times we may see leaders saying something, but then the actual prize or win goes to another team who isn't acting that way. So again, a powerful tool to bring to your leaderships of like, hey, you said this, but oh, by the way, you actually rewarded this. They don't really go together. Um, how can we work together so that they are a match? Or you may say, hey, leader, you're saying this, but you're not incentivizing us. Here are some ideas for some incentives incentives or rewards. It doesn't have to be monetary. It could just be um, recognition, a name, or something like that. Okay, moving on to the next box. We've got peer networks. So this is us, right? This is like our co-conspirators, our people who are doing the things. They can be in your organization or they can be out. So these are the things. What are we saying to each other? You know, what books are we reading? What messages are we saying? Um, what are the people who are maybe not at the top, but um, maybe like middle management or your project leads, like what are they saying? Are their messages consistent with the culture that we're trying to bring? Also too is the power of influence. <laughs> I think all of us here understand the criticality of being able to lead without authority. So this is a way to engage your peer network, just identifying like, okay, who else could become a co-conspirator for this culture change? Um, another one too I'll point out before we jump to this one is the mentors. Um, that's really powerful too, you know, reaching out to say, hey, you know, I'm interested in changing my culture this way. I know you've done it in your organization. What tips can you give us? Um, that's, if you can find mentors, and I'm sure 
mentors who have successfully done this would be happy to share. Definitely, that's a very valuable resource. Okay, now moving on to training and education. This is a really tactical one that I think is really um, a quick win. So here, it, you can go online, Coursera, there's so many options, especially now in this virtual environment. What kind of trainings do we wanna bring our teeth? What kind of trainings do we wanna bring to our people? What kind of workshops? Um, what are the things, what webinars? You could also propose creating your own and giving it to the team. It could be a brown bag lunch. It can be a virtual workshop you throw together. Any of these things to spread that education and share that knowledge. Um, you know, and this is also a place where you can bring up the desired skills in your culture and say, hey, we are here and we wanna be here and to get there, we need these skills. So, oh, by the way, leader, can you make sure I get into this class so I get the certification and help our organization get there? Yeah, training and education is a huge gap in the missing. Yeah, so this is a really big one, I think. Um, definitely highly recommend looking at all these options here. Okay, moving on to literature. So this is kind of like your less formal training education. It's articles that you have online, articles that you author like Daniel mentioned, books, papers, videos. Um, I think another important thing here is kind of, in certain industries, there's a manifesto or an ethos. Specifically, I'm thinking of like the Agile manifesto, right? It's so short, it's so direct and to the point, but consider creating one for your culture of like, hey, if we want to be more agile, we need to read this manifesto. Hey, um, our organization wants to be X, let's write our own manifesto. So you can also create this literature as well. Yeah, I would just offer up at this um, point, just a quick backstory on ITK was that we were started through one of these peer networks that Dan Ward put together as soon as he joined MITRE, he was brand new. So the company, he just started asking people, hey, who around here is trying to do something different and trying to push the boundaries and be a bit of a disruptor? And we put together this group that was interested in innovation. Jen and I were both a part of it. And we would go around the room and talk about the books we were reading. We would train each other on different innovation activities that, or lessons learned from different activities that we did outside of work. And I think that, in and of itself is culture change and in just the most real form. And that was, you know, four years ago that we all got together and started having those lunch groups. So it's one of those meta things where I don't think I've actually even put that together, but it was like, that was a peer network with literature and training <laughs> that uh, Dan, you know, came into the company and did not having a real like leadership position as, um, you know, he's obviously become quite a leader at the company since then, but um, you know, find those co-conspirators and yeah, absolutely. YouTube podcasts, content, all the content, audio books. Yeah, if I could, if I could just foot stomp that really quick, because yeah. it's something that's come up a lot in, in a lot of our conversations. I know Chris Williams and I in, in conversations that we're having with people who want to make a big change in their organization, what it keeps boiling down to at the beginning is you what you want to do this big thing, but are you who you need to be to sustain that effort? Because before you can undergo a big cultural change, you need to make sure that, you know, it's like I said earlier, you need to make sure that you have the fuel to power through all of the stuff it's going to take to make that cultural change happen. And, and a lot of times what that, what that means at the outset is form a community, find co-conspirators, find people who can sustain that effort. So before it's, what are we doing? It's, who are we and what are our values and what is it that keeps us going? Uh, yeah. And that's why like a lot of our, our conversations have keep going back to, all right, that's, that's cool that you want to do that, that stuff. Let's start from you, who you are and what your culture is. And that's why Agitari actually started is because I was like, I've been trying to do this, like promote this stuff as an individual for so long. I just keep burning myself out. You, you know, I'll do, I'll build a community where that's our goal. And then, when we're tired of doing all the external stuff, we can focus inward and sustain each other. And that's how we're gonna keep moving forward and keep this as a sustained effort. Great ad. Absolutely. Thanks, I Daniel. so agree with that, Daniel. Yeah, and Rachel, that's a great example. Um, you know, 
with this culture change canvas, I said these four boxes are all equal, like you're going to cycle through them. And what I love hearing too is you may start with one box and then bleed out into the others and leadership may be the last one you engage with, or you might try to do an initial pass at all four and come back to it. So really kind of what I love about this canvas is that it forces you to consider all four sides. You know, if you're not making the impact that you want, it gives you another quadrant to say, hmm, okay, how can I leverage a peer network and build a community? Maybe that'll help me with this culture thing. So in our last slide, you know, the way to use this tool is once you identify the different elements within each of those quadrants, you know, start identifying the concrete actions of like, okay, we got a list of trainings that we want to do. Let's prioritize them and go to the boss and get the funding. We don't need any funds. We just need the hours and the permission or man, you might not even need the permission, just do it. Um, and so this really kind of helps you go from like something amorphous and conceptual to actual tactical actions. And again, if you revisit the culture change canvas after some time, you start seeing, oh, actually we made some progress. Like, oh yeah, we had a couple of lunch and learns and we recruited more people. So even though that patina feeling isn't showing up yet, by measuring your own progress against a certain time period, you can see, okay, we are making progress. And again, um, for those of you who have leadership who may not necessarily as quickly or clearly see the value, everyone loves metrics. So you can use this as a way to show your metrics of like, we went from zero trainings to 15 in two months. Okay, that's something. So, you know, again, this is a conversation starter. Um, I would recommend in this type of tool, you do want to allow people to really think. So I would recommend probably 90 minutes. Um, and then when you revisit at a later time, you can do that in shorter periods. Uh, one of the things with this tool is you also don't want to let people go too long because then the amount of actions becomes too overwhelming of like oh my gosh we have to change so much culture so use <laughs> right <laughs> so you can use time like strategically here and say okay let's just get that first hack out there we're only gonna spend eight minutes in each box and then eight minutes discussing it um, and that's a way you can start getting some conversations going so i've talked a lot uh rachel anything to add and then i'd love to hear from our audience and questions yeah, I think just going back to if you're a new leader going in, I could see even using this on your own and saying, hey, this is what I've seen. This is what I think the culture should be. And then using that as a as a jumping off point, um, even if you you don't want to subject people to like a 90 minute session. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, it's a really yeah. great tool. One lightning round you could do is just the left hand side of like, well, let's just describe our characteristics and circle the adjectives that we think we are and identify what we want to be and where it is. And then you can do the right hand side at a later time. Michael asks, uh, would you run through this canvas with different organizational leaders to get their input or just present the results of this to them? Ooh, great question. Um, so in the spirit of like with, not to, I would recommend inviting them to your brainstorming session, whether that's the very first one or maybe a second one that you have after a little more maturity and collecting some initial thoughts. And then if they can't make it, so be it. But then scheduling a time of like, hey, our group got together. We have some ideas and some recommendations. We'd love to get your inputs. Um, and also, you know, it depends on the leadership style. You know, even within our organization, we have many different types of leaders. Some other kind are the kind who are like, I trust you, just tell me what you need and I'll give you the resources. Others want to really understand, others want to mentor you. So I think that's kind of leadership dependent. Uh, Rachel, how about you? What do you think? Yeah, I would agree. I, I think it depends on how involved they would like to get. I'm thinking of some of the leaders that I've gone to asking for training and they're, they've been pretty open and just said, oh, you want to do it? Sure, go for it. Oh, you want to share that article? Yeah, um, I'm down. But there might be others who would say, well, why? Um, and th then maybe you want to have that conversation. Cool. Um, 
All right, so this whole next section is kind of like designed to be an ask me anything. It can be about the tools, design thinking, something All else, facilitator tips. Contact info up there too. If you, Good. As we, as we chat. Yeah, so feel free to put something in the chat or just come off of mute. Um, would love to hear some stories too from our facilitators of like, hey, what has worked so far in your community? Like also a learning opportunity for Rachel and I to hear more from you guys too. I'll shoot one so, off real quick. No, sure. Daniel, you go ahead. No, no, you go, Chris. I've already talked too much. <laughs> All right, fine, fine, I will go. Um, I think one thing that I love about both the pre-mortem uh, and the culture canvas here, and I can tell you guys had systems engineers and human factors folks and, you know, the RT and the science going back and forth, because I, I come from that background as well, kind of splitting the difference between the two. Um, it lowers the barriers to entry to do something like this. And instead of having people ask, how do we get people in the room to do this? The questions you guys already have in this setting even, is what is the time amount for us to run it? We're already comfortable with trying it, right? We're, you've yeah. already, just by explaining the tool, you, you seem to have a group of people that are willing to engage with it and try it out. They just wanna know how long to do it. And I think like lowering the threshold to entry to do something like this, to practice with it for the first time, it's probably the, great, the greatest success a facilitator can have when, when talking about this to other people. Um, so that, that's yeah, my that, comment. Not that's really a great comment. comment. I think we've definitely had before we had the uh, the website and the canvases, we kind of just had these ideas of what we wanted to do and what we wanted to make happen. It was a little bit too nebulous for people. They said, yeah, sounds interesting, uh, but the canvas really makes it tangible and tactile. And especially when we were able to be in person, you print out the worksheet, you put it in front of people, fill it out, right? Like you don't really need, <laughs> too much training to fill out some questions and talk about it. Um, obviously there's the facilitator adds the objective third party and kind of draws out the insights, um, but it does, it does make it a lot more approachable. So I'm, I'm happy to hear that you, you feel that way. <laughs> That's what we hope. I want to print like a huge one of these out and then just be able to sticky note away on it. I yes. want like 10 foot by 10 foot. I think that'd be pretty yeah. cool. That would That's such be. a cool idea. Yeah, no, I actually like, I'm really interested in the, in the specific, like the mechanisms that make these specific games work, right? Or like I call them games because I'm in the middle of the book game storming, uh, which talks about like the design of these experiences, starting with, you know, like the invitation, which is what you're talking about. Like that mm -hmm. is a hugely important phase. Like what is the experience of being presented this opportunity? And then what's the, what's the experience of, where if you're giving somebody somebody uh, if you're giving somebody something nebulous, it's really intimidating. And but if you just here's some boxes to fill in, uh, it's a it's a lot simpler. So you're actually tricking them into navigating complexity by by adding constraints. Yes. Yeah. It says mindset priming. Absolutely. <laughs> it feels yeah. a little nostalgic too, right? Like in high school, how we had to fill out worksheets for homework every night. You're like, oh yeah, I got this. I haven't had to do that in a while. Yeah, and I actually, I like how uh, the ITK team is building tools specifically for your, like it's for your workplace, right? And that's something mm -hmm. that Agitari has been kind of engaged in is how do we design these tools in a way that works for like specifically it remotely? So that's one question that I have for you is have you, have you adapted these to be remote experiences yet? Because uh, we've been entirely remote so far. Um, and then I, I, let's just stop there because I forgot what else I was going to say. So have you uh, adapted them for remote work? Jen, you want to take that one? I can jump in too. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes. So <laughs> it's a struggle. It's a struggle. The it's a short answer. My three yeses is Yes, we have taken these virtual. Yes, we have done virtual workshops. Um, MITRE has a lot of distributed teams. So we do, we've, you know, had virtual workshops before. But last Friday, I finally counted like, okay, since COVID happened, like what's been going down? Why am I so virtually burnt out? Um, I counted 26 workshops 
Um, and those were all virtual. So definitely happy to share some tactics for like, how can you do this effectively in a virtual setting where you can't actually use post-its and have people look at it together. I actually find sometimes a virtual session has some very nice advantages. Um, one that I'll highlight is the Zoom breakout room where you literally force people to go away and then you force people to come back. So you don't have any lingering, right? You can say, you have eight minutes and I'm timing you, go. You know, people can't be like, oh, I'm gonna go to the bathroom. Like, um, you know, one thing I'll definitely say and kind of to Chris's point of like lowering the barrier of entry, what I love about like running these sessions is we can just say, you know, it's an hour of your time. All you have to do is show up. You don't have to do any work beforehand because we have the structured questions because we're going to run it as we do. And the worst that could happen is you thought that hour was a waste of your time. Like, great, go buy a failure cake, you know? So I think also <laughs> having levity in the invitation as you kick it off, um, you know, especially for our new facilitators, don't look for that immediate feedback of someone saying like, that was so great. If they say that, awesome. But a lot of times, a really thought-provoking session, people will walk away and be like, whoa, right? And that's yeah. not at all an indicator of who you are or what you've done. It's the fact that you have now opened their eyes to something else. Um, Rachel, how about thoughts for you and you? Yeah, I would say um, getting the platforms to work for us has been part of it, like the Zoom breakout rooms, like the emoji reactions, like the chat, I think, I think chat is honestly kind of an underrated benefit to um, these types of sessions because you can have a whole conversation even like today a little bit going on in the chat and people either amping each other up or asking probing questions while we're talking about the tool. It's almost more efficient than if we were in the room together. Uh, and then we've also just done a lot more prep work, I would say, versus before we mm -hmm. could show up and say, okay, we're all going to get in the room for eight hours. Now it's more, okay, let's spend eight hours preparing for one hour and let's make that hour as tight as possible so that we're not wasting people's time. They're not getting burnt out. We know exactly who needs to be there and why they're there. So just getting like the participant list down, you'll, I'm sure you've all found like, oh, this was forwarded to me. I'm just here to listen in. Okay, that's not gonna be a very helpful addition to our workshop. Um, making sure that the right people are involved, making sure that we know exactly what outcomes we're trying to get to. Um, and I think even just that is, at least in our culture, more, a big benefit to um, you know, getting people all on the same call together. I don't think it's done often enough um, where people all agree that this is what we're trying to do and this is the, the purpose of the session. Um, Absolutely. Um, one thing I'll add on, and I um, saw a comment in the chat about Chris, about people who join anonymously. So when you're the facilitator, you have control, right? Like you can, I've literally called people out and been like, okay, who is the 212 number? Can you identify yourself? And like literally crickets. And I'll be like, okay, you've got 10 seconds until I'm deleting you. And then I will delete them. And what I always <laughs> say, like, they'll call back if they were crucial. Put them on blast. Put them on blast. Yeah. Um, the other thing I do is in the invites, I always say like, come video ready. So I kick off every meeting already on the video. Um, I have like literally my environment so people can see like, oh, she's just showing up as she is. Like, and that's what we want to encourage, right? The other thing too is um, you'll notice that when I kicked off, I asked you guys, hey, where are you guys from? Throw me something in the chat. Um, then I directed you to the reactions and give me the thumbs up or the clapping. By doing that in the beginning, I already primed you guys for like, I'm gonna interact with you. This is how you do it. This is how you're gonna reach me. So all these subtle ways of hitting people and letting them know like, oh, oh, there's a chat button. Oh, that's what I do. Um, and encouraging people to come on video, uh, that would definitely work. There's some people like, you know, I was glitching out before where with bandwidth, sometimes I just cannot be on video and, you know, just being flexible with that. Yeah, two and also, two has logged off. <laughs> <laughs> we've also Thanks. started doing some more like pre-work. Um, so Microsoft Forms is a tool that we have access to, but I'm sure there are plenty of other tools out there um, to just collect feedback from people so that we go into the session 
either knowing a little bit about the participants or having them already do their like individual brainstorming before we come to the group. And then we can say, okay, this is what you all said to this question. Now we can uh, discuss together. So doing more work asynchronously before we bring everyone together mm -hmm. to discuss synchronously. Yeah, I know we've tried to explore a little bit of that with Agitari. Uh, Daniel's asked it a number of times in the in the Def Slack. You know, yeah. what is the best way to go about you know generation um, mm -hmm. asynchronously? Because it's right. tough. You know, you're you're now yes. you're now you're doing asynchronous generation and coming into a remote session, and yep. it's totally flipped on its head from what uh from what it would have been six months to a year ago. So it's good. Yeah. cool to hear y'all's experience in that. It's definitely been a lot of lessons learned. I think sometimes the pre-work doesn't work out. People don't do it or what have you. Um, but yeah, it's all, a lot of experimenting. I will yeah, say... just on that. Oh, go ahead, Daniel. Um, I, just on that topic of like the asynchronous stuff, I've been, I've been sort of experimenting with sessions within Def on, on Slack where we have a board set up and then I just keep dragging people back to the board in like a virtual whiteboard, like Miro or something to, and I'm just like, okay, here's the next prompt. I want you to go into there. And I'm really like, I'm actually really excited about the idea of being able to do sessions in these micro bursts, as opposed to forcing somebody to pay close attention and be super mm -hmm. invested for an hour. Uh, so yeah, I, one thing I've seen is like a lot of the pre-work that people used to do, it looks kind of like surveys, which really are a real struggle to get people to engage in for any, you know, prolonged period of time. So it's something that we're, we're definitely experimenting with as well. Yeah, I, I like the way you describe that, the microburst. I feel like that's already pretty energizing just in the naming convention of it. Um, for asynchronous collaboration, I, I have three different things that I use depending on the type of workshop I'm running. So one of the things that I've done is email out a participant workbook. Um, typically it looks like PowerPoint and it is very like human centered design where sometimes I will literally have the entire slide all in a solid, you know, navy background and one little white box saying type here and a question to make it very obvious of like, I'm just trying to get one answer to one question, or it may be an editable form of the canvases that I expect to use in our session, something like that. Um, Rachel had mentioned this before, but the use of surveys and forms, I've, I've really been liking Microsoft Forms because it gives you immediate responses and you can also run some analytics on it. So that's interesting to run. And the third option is um, again, my ethos is always, you just need to show up. I'm not going to make you do any work beforehand. So I will build in five minutes of very awkward silence while everybody goes to the survey or does whatever they need to do. And, you know, that gives people permission of like, oh, we all only spent five minutes on it. It doesn't have to be amazing or brilliant. And it also kind of reduces the burden on people to do that work. Um, so sometimes I've used breakout rooms where literally everyone will go into an individual breakout room so they can't just like chit chat or feel awkward and then, then I'll pull them back in. Yeah, I just wanna to get to a couple of the other um, questions in the chat. So sure. um, Austin asked, it seems like design thinking is diverging a ton on different methodologies and tools, which is great, but I think all the divergence is making the barriers for entry more difficult. Do you think there will eventually be a convergence around these ideas? So just to clarify that you're asking about the, there's so many methodologies out there to the point where it's like, where do I start? That kind of a thing. Yeah, it's a super meta question, but basically, <laughs> yeah, there's so many tools and things like that, you know, and the, the double diamond and things like that, like diverge, converge, converge. converge. Right. Um, so sort of using that tool to reflect back on itself and everyone has uh, their the, own, right? Yes. Everyone has their own set of methodologies. We did a, a canvas when we started the ITK at MITRE looking out into industry and academia. And I think we made a spreadsheet of over 300 tools and it was not deduplicated, but still <laughs> so many tools out there and everyone has their own version of a journey map and their own version of card sorting and what is the difference. So that's 
that's kind of why we put together our own so that it was tailored. And I think you're right that it's probably, you know, we're adding to what's out there. Um, but maybe that's the answer is to just do that work for your audience. At least that was the answer that we, we chose was to do the work for our specific users in our audience and say, this is what you should do. Um, but of course, we're, we're not going to mandate that for all of you. Um, but maybe that something that Agitari does is says, hey, this is this is what we do. This is our uh, methodology. And yeah, Jen. <laughs> yeah, um, on that point. So we intentionally made a pre-filtered list of just 25 tools, right? It's a lot more manageable to look through 25 than the two or 300. And we made these tools specifically in the Creative Commons license. So that means you can download it, edit it, customize it, and use it. We want people to do that. Like take our tools and make them your own. Um, just take the straight 25 and be like, okay, this is the set that we're using. And oh, by the way, instead of saying user, we're gonna say warfighter, um, whatever have you. Yeah, no, I think that that's actually a really valuable question from uh, Austin for for a lot of new like newcomers to the whole facilitation thing because it does seem like everybody's saying that you know, like all of these specific specifically for profit methodologies are saying our tools will get you there one hundred percent of the time if you just use them correctly. And well, yeah, it, it's like I guess theoretically that would be true if if they like kept going through using your whatever iterative process infinitely they'd probably get to the right solution but one reason that i like the adaptation of these tools is to like understand it built for a different context and then adapt it which is what miter has done and what agitari is doing we're taking you know we're stealing like artists we're we're grabbing stuff and we're being like does this work for our people no okay well let's do something else another thing to add though is that a lot of the uh, the timelines for these tools can be extremely different. Like if you're talking about a full-fledged design uh, process like the Darden School teaches, you're talking about weeks or months of full-time design work if you include the am amount of research that's involved. So there's a completely different, you're, like you're talking about two, you're talking about the same thing, but at different scales when you're looking at some of these different tools, which is something to bear in mind. Uh, there's like the one hour workshop, which is the same thing as the four month sprint, just for a different type of outcome. Yeah, that's a really good point. And yeah. uh, just before I forget about this, uh, one other question from Steven about, um, do you have any video training with facilitation tips for examples? Um, I. I don't think we have, we have some recorded sessions similar to this one, um, but we've been talking about doing some videos for the tools. Maybe we'll have to re, we have a video on our about page that's like nine minutes long. It gives like a little quick intro to uh, a few of our favorites. So yeah. in true side hustle spirit, we've got some things we've got in our side hustle queue. Uh, exactly. <laughs> so exactly. I definitely recommend checking out the website, our blog. We have some blog articles specifically on tools and on the tool, individual tools will have some additional things. Um, we have done a series of virtual trainings. We are in the process of getting it publicly released and creating our ITK YouTube channel, which is going to be off the hook. Um, so we've got that coming and we've had multiple requests for training. So, you know, that's why we were so thrilled to be invited into this community because we're like, yes, we would love to um, meet with you guys and do this training and go on and share it with others. So please continue to reach out for, to us and make that request. Um, for those of you who may even have STE available, which is like a little different than your typical like contractor FTE, there may be another MITRE project already in your organization and then we can might be able to come in and drop in and do a training or something like that. So we will find a way to make it work. And um, Daniel, uh, one other thing I wanted to add to about the lower barrier to entry combining with what Chris said is absolutely industry tells you like use my product and you will become a multi-billionaire overnight. <laughs> Not really. So we always caveat our sessions of like we are here to get the conversation started. We are not going to solve one hunger, world hunger in one hour, but we can 
devote one really good productive hour at it. So being very intentional about that expectation setting of like, we are going to iterate on this after this. There is going to be more after this. Sometimes it may truly be only an hour and that's it. So um, definitely that is a tip that I would give to folks. Um, yeah. Any other questions? This was just fun. I just like this stuff. Yeah, <laughs> us too. Yeah. Yeah, thank you guys uh, so much for for coming on and, and teaching your method. Uh, yeah, what we've been mostly focusing on is our like Discovery 101 sessions. And I thought it would be really cool to start bringing partners in to teach their methods because we're not like, Agitare wants to be framework agnostic. We want to just promote these practices and help people find their way to to you know frameworks that work for them or create their own that work for them. So this has been uh, just an incredible introduction to some tools that I think I'm about to use with Chris in a session. Like, <laughs> like you know, we have a session coming up and just like seeing some of these, I'm like, oh yeah, we definitely are going to be employing the uh, culture change canvas i think in the next uh, discovery 101 session so it thank awesome. you both so much for i'm glad we were thinking the same thing yeah <laughs> <laughs> little unsaid telepathy love it <laughs> great well thanks so much for having yeah. us and feel free to reach out if you think of any other questions let us know if you use the tools too yeah it was well, so absolutely. nice to meet everyone please, please, please reach out, out. Tools. Is that what this is about? Thanks, guys. <laughs> All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks. Thank you, everybody, bye. For showing up. See you, everyone. <laughs>